Hey y'all and welcome to our third One Wolf Call of 2023. As a reminder, these calls are quarterly and the next call is Thursday, October 12th, which will be the very last one of 2023. I'm Ashley Carrington, located in North Carolina, she, they pronouns, and co-facilitating with me tonight is Mary Beth Gardham from Iowa, Mary Beth giveaway. And our technical support guru this evening is Ellen Thomas, if you can wave Ellen from the mountains of North Carolina. This meeting is sponsored by the members of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. section. And as a note, this is a public call. And yes, we are recording. The video will be posted in a few days to Wolf's YouTube channel and the One Wolf Call webpage. And you can look for those links in the chat as well as in the text pad. And Mary Beth is going to be placing those in there now. Wolf is the oldest international peace organization in the world, founded in 1915 by Jane Addams of Hull House. There are Wolf branches across the U.S., and we are one of the 50 Wolf sections around the world. You can find out more and join us at our website at www.wolfus.org join. And that information is also located in the text pad and in the chat. These One Wolf calls connect our organization to one another and keep us strong across the United States. We are women-centered, though we welcome male, queer, and members of the trans community, as well as gender expansive individuals as well. We are urgently looking for amazing detail-oriented volunteers to help plan and facilitate the future of these One Wolf calls. So please contact us at info at wolfus.org to find out more or how you can be involved. And a few housekeeping notes. Please remain muted when you are not speaking to reduce the background noise. And please place any questions or comments in the chat. And Mary Beth will be putting the agenda into the chat now. There is also a Google Doc, the text pad, where you can add in information. Please make sure when you are adding information into the text pad, you add it under the red line. You'll see that within the text pad. Look for that link to the text pad in the chat as well. And these links will be put into the chat continuously throughout the night. All right, so let's roll call. Place your name, your pronouns, and the, loca and the location you're calling from in the chat. And now passing it over to Mary Beth. Mary Beth? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mary Beth Gardham, longtime Wolf member from Iowa City, Iowa. We're pleased tonight uh, to present an esteemed editor and writer on economic topics, reporting on a development of international economic importance, BJ Prashad. We'll hear from him in just a moment. We'll also share short update reports from Wolf's Tura Campanella Cook, co chair of Wolf's Middle East Peace and Justice. Action Committee and from our Disarm Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll get also an update from Shilpa Pandey, co-coordinator of this year's UN Practicum for Advocacy in New York City, uh, which will US sponsors at the Commission on the Status of Women event. But first, let's get right to our featured speaker. Um, Vijay Prashad is an American-based Indian historian and commentator. He is executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, the chief editor of Left Word Books, and a senior non-resident fellow at Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, Renmin University of China. Mr. Prashad was the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History and a professor of international studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut from 1996 to 2017. During this presentation, if you have questions for Mr. Prashad, please put them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on you. Uh, so welcome to the One Wolf National Organizing Call, Mr. Prashad. Recently, your article in Popular Resistance captured our attention because of the striking comparison you made between economic and debt policy at the World Bank and the new, more people-centered policies of the New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. Uh, I'm gonna put the link to that article in the chat. Uh, your article comes at a time when debt is much on the minds of people in the United States, 
while we contend with the annual by part political gamesmanship around our national budget and the games people play to get the pork that they want. You're, you cover different ways of choosing to deal with debt in ways that don't place that burden on the poorest and most vulnerable people. And you cited the election of BRICS Bank's new chair, a woman of exceptional experience, Dilma Rousseff. Please tell us the significance of Ms. Rousseff's election and how her anti-debt stance may offer hope uh, for global poverty and anything else you want to tell us. Well, firstly, it's tre tremendous honor to be with you. Um, you know, uh, you are a stalwart in attempting to build peace in the world, the very opposite of your own government um, and most of the media. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, just as an example, just carried a story about, you know, a Chinese spy base being built in Cuba. Hours later, after the Wall Street Journal's really quite remarkable story. Even the Pentagon had to deny the story. Uh, I found that quite alarming that the media is so reckless these days in reporting things, almost no care for the truth. So I'm very happy to be here because I know that each and every one of you is not only interested in the truth, which is, I understand, difficult um, in a so-called post-truth age, but we still believe in the truth and of course you believe in peace so i'm really happy to be here um before i get to your question about dilma rousseff a quite remarkable woman i want to talk a little bit about development just to put this in context there was no word like development before 1945 i mean let's face it before 1945 most of the world was colonized and you know the british colonial authorities were not thinking about the development of india when the British left India, were thrown out of India in 1947, the literacy rate in India was 13%. That's one, three percent, 13%. Um, so much for the civilizing mission of colonialism and for any precursor to development, it just wasn't on the agenda. Development as a concept is a post-World War II idea and it's brought into play um, largely because of the depredation of colonialism. You see, between the 18th century and the 20th century, the British government, British stole 45 trillion, 45 trillion sterling from India. So the Indian people created wealth. Britain didn't reinvest that wealth in India. They took that wealth with them to Britain and invested it in Britain. And so when India won independence from Britain, it was 45 trillion sterling minus at that point. The wealth of India was sitting in British banks and there was no Marshall Plan for India. There was no reparations for India. And I'm using India as an example. Every single one of the colonized countries could be the example. It's just that a very good economic historian, Utsa Patnaik, I mean, she looked at all the data and she put the $45 trillion number together. So I'm using the example of India. India was one of the largest colonies, but this applies to almost the entire African continent, applies to large parts of Latin America, the Caribbean, and so on. So after World War II, there was a problem. There were all these new states in Asia, Africa, Latin America that had won their independence. But in order for them to move a development agenda, a peace agenda, an agenda to have the dignity of their people established, they needed finances. Uh, they simply didn't have them. When the colonialists left, they left the banks empty. So these countries had to very tragically go back to their old colonial masters and ask to borrow money. Um, that was the nature of the commercial loans given to the formerly colonized states. Some of this money came as what is known as ODI, Overseas Development you know, Aid and so on, different packages. So there was private sector lending to the formerly colonized countries and public sector lending, some government lending. This lending really is development. Um, what it is, is the creation of further debt in the third world. Um, 
you know, instead of development. In fact, a synonym for development from the 1950s onward is permanent debt. And indeed, there has been a permanent debt crisis, so much so that countries from the 1960s started to borrow money, not for investment or for trade or to enhance infrastructure. No, no, they were not borrowing for anything like that, trade, investment, infrastructure. They were borrowing to service the previous debt. In other words, if they had taken a $10 million debt in year one, in year two, they had to pay, let's say, two and a half million dollars as the interest on the debt. So now they had to borrow two and a half million dollars to pay off the interest on a $10 million debt. Guess what? By year three, they had a debt of 12 and a half million. So now they had to borrow $3 million to pay off the debt servicing, the interest on the 12 and a half million quite usurious rates of debt. And you can do this calculation, it's pretty simple. By the time we get to the present day, the debt is in the hundreds of billions. <laughs> it's unpayable debt. Um, most of the countries known as the less developed countries, the LDCs, simply have no pathway out of debt, frankly. And the International Monetary Fund, to be very precise about the institution that institutionalized permanent debt, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank based in Washington, D.C., which basically answer to the U.S. Treasury Department, these two institutions pushed a project of debt service financing, in other words, borrow money to pay off your interest, to pay off the wealthy bondholders in Europe, Japan, and the United States. The IMF pushed a program of debt financing, or rather financing for debt servicing, take finance to service your debt. And if you can't pay that, in order to get the benediction from the IMF, a good report from the IMF, which is just like, you know, a ratings agency rating like Moody's and uh, so on. The IMF rating is very much like an international rating for developing countries. Um, if you do not exceed to the IMF pressure, what the IMF is telling you, they give you a bad rating. Well, what is the IMF telling these countries? The IMF is saying, in order to service your debt better, now remember, not to take financing for infrastructure, investment, any of that, just to take financing to pay off the wealthy bondholders. If you're not doing the following things, we'll give you a bad rating, and then you'll have to borrow at a more expensive rate. What did they demand of these countries? Number one, stop spending on health, stop spending on education, Stop spending on water supplies. Stop spending on electricity. Stop subsidizing consumption. Let the private sector take care of it. Now, the burden of the IMF austerity policies was almost entirely borne by women in the third world who had to go out there and walk kilometers to get water to their homes because there was no pipe created, who had to find a way to get firewood to make food because there was no natural gas piped into their homes and so on. Why was there no water? Why was there no natural gas? Because the IMF told their governments, don't subsidize consumption. Subsidizing consumption is a violation of free market enterprise. It's a violation of the principles of the free market. Okay, so the IMF enforced austerity on countries that were already in quite dire straits after the long histories of colonialism. You can now understand why people in the third world deeply frustrated with the IMF and the World Bank. None of them ever from 1944, from when they were formed in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, neither the World Bank nor the International Monetary Fund at any moment actually moved an agenda for genuine improvement of the condition of life of the vast majority of the people. So none of the countries, Sri Lanka, for instance, 14 
different loans from the IMF now catastrophically in a debt crisis. None of these countries was able to exit permanent debt and none of them were able to eradicate poverty. I want you to listen to this and perhaps let this register. Not one of the countries that has come under the surveillance of the International Monetary Fund or has received World Bank money has been able to eradicate poverty. Not one country. The only developing country in recent years that actually eradicated absolute poverty was the People's Republic of China. And it was not through IMF funding or through World Bank loans. It's very interesting development. My institute, Tricontinental, did a study on how did China eradicate absolute poverty, you know, uh, certainly not by building fantasy spy bases in Cuba, just to let you know. Uh, they've been using their resources for the people's benefit rather than to allow billionaires and trillionaires, near trillionaires, to move their money to tax havens. Mostly Western billionaires and near trillionaires move their money into tax havens, which now amount to at least, our institute calculated, at least $32 trillion. Now, just like the British, <laughs> took out the wealth from India, didn't reinvest it in India. US hundreds of millionaires, billionaires, near trillionaires are not investing their money back into the country. They are removing it to tax havens or they're keeping it liquid in banks and not being made to pay the penalty through any taxation regime. And that money gets quote unquote lent to the third world in a kind of mafia-esque structure which enforces austerity against the very poorest people in the planet so when brazil russia india china and south africa joined together in 2009 to create the BRICS project this project put front and center the creation of alternative institutions to the imf and the world bank the contingency reserve arrangement is the alternative to the imf but today I'm not going to share anything about that. That's a separate issue. The alternative to the World Bank is the new development bank based in Shanghai, which is also called the BRICS Bank. And it's now third Secretary General of the BRICS Bank is the former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff. Now, interesting, Dilma Rousseff was the president of Brazil before she was illegally removed from her presidency by an act of lawfare, Dilma Rousseff was the architect alongside then her predecessor and now current president of Brazil, Lula Ignacio de Silva, known as Lula. Dilma and Lula were the architects of Brazil nearly abolishing poverty. In fact, they came so close, they were fettered by the United Nations. And then when Dilma was removed from office and Temer took her place and then Bolsonaro, poverty rates started to skyrocket in Brazil. So she brings to the BRICS Bank a commitment to ending debt to create austerity and for financing for development, for infrastructure, trade, investment, not financing for debt servicing. So the BRICS Bank has a completely different approach. The goal of the BRICS Bank is pretty much to end poverty. That's the goal. The goal of the World Bank in name is to end poverty. But in fact, it is a partner organization of the IMF, which is creating permanent debt. You couldn't have a more stark comparison between these two sets of institutions. The Washington based World Bank, quote unquote World Bank. In fact, the name is not the World Bank. The official name is the International Bank of reconstruction and development um, set up after World War II. Reconstruction was Europe and development was the third world. More money was spent in the Marshall Plan than in development projects uh, without a uh, debt component. If you compare the World Bank to the BRICS Bank, it's a stunning comparison. But in this article, which Mary Beth so graciously read and therefore invited me here, I use the occasion of two new leaders of these institutions, Dilma Rousseff, who I've already introduced to you, 
and a man of Indian origin who is now the head of the World Bank, who comes from the corporate world. He comes from the world of credit cards and big corporations. Um, doesn't have one bit of experience in development or what is known euphemistically as poverty alleviation. Not one jot of experience. This is where we are today, friends. And I'm going to wrap up with this, Mary Beth. This is where we are. We are in a world situation now where almost the entire global south is looking at the United States and wondering what's going on. We no longer have faith in your institutions. And yet here you are fear mongering about China, which during the pandemic came into 22 odd African countries and just ended the debt, whatever debt was owed to China. And here's the Western media. I mean, just red in the face about these realities in the world cannot understand why is it that people in Africa, Asia, Latin America just don't believe what the West is saying about China. And look at it this way. Anytime I talk like this, Mary Beth, anytime I talk like this, somebody will say, oh, you're paid by the Chinese government. In fact, my fellowship at Renman University is unpaid. I, I don't get any money from the Chinese government. I would like to believe that these are things I actually believe. I don't need to be paid to say them. But this is such threatening stuff that even recently the Daily Beast did an article basically saying, you're an agent of China. I mean, for God's sake, when can we have an adult conversation about the state of the world without being like children at the playground, you know, screaming and shouting and tearing each other apart? I happen to believe that China has done something quite remarkable in abolishing absolute poverty. I also happen to believe that Dilma Rousseff has a genuine agenda to end poverty around the world. At least these people have a record of doing that. I don't see any record like that at the World Bank, at the International Monetary Fund, and least of all, dear friends, I don't see any record of that by any US government for its own people. I was recently for three and a half weeks traveling around China. I was in Shanghai for some time and I drove around all across as much as I could in the city. I didn't see one homeless encampment. You arrive in Los Angeles, you drive into Santa Monica, rich part of the United States. There's homelessness rife in the city. Now people say, OK, the Chinese pick up the homeless and throw them out of the city, whatever. I don't think that's happening, by the way. Journalists have looked into it. But if it were happening, we'd hear about it. And in fact, the Wall Street Journal would have written many, many stories about it. The fact is, that is a project that doesn't want to see homelessness and is embarrassed by that. I don't see any US government, let alone the government in California, you know, a liberal state. I don't see any of these governments, any of them paying attention to something as embarrassing as homelessness and hunger. I don't see it. So when people in places like India and so on look at these two projects, well, they're not foolish. They're making up their minds. Thanks a lot. This monthly call uh, has been going on for a number of years. Uh, it was monthly, now it's quarterly. And in the past, we had an excellent speaker and historian uh, from Africa who told a similar story, Maurice Carney, and I put the link to that recording in the chat. We also had a man from the um, US Jubilee Network talking about the crushing debt that has been visited on Puerto Rico and other Caribbean nations. So um, there are many examples of this. Uh, our committee, Women, Money, and Democracy, has been studying the uh, oppressive nature of debt and the fact that it keeps us as a people, as a nation, as, as a species, from being the people we were meant to be from uh, from using the qualities and values that we're naturally drawn to, generosity, empathy, all of those things, um, because um, debt makes us so um, afraid. We, uh, we cannot be who we are meant to be. So um, with that, 
having been said, um, I, I would welcome questions for Vijay from any of our participants. Um, please raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. I'll check the chat now. Uh, uh, Virginia Pratt asks, what can we do to dial back the call to war with China by the United States? Um, Virginia, what can one say? I mean, you know, I just wrote a story for Globetrotter on the Shangri-La dialogue that took place in Singapore, which happened around the same time as a U.S. and Canadian frigate and destroyer were near Chinese waters and they almost clashed with the Chinese destroyer. Um, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was in Singapore and so was Defense Secretary Lee from China. And Defense Secretary Lee asked, you know, said, we need more collaboration. It's very dangerous out there because the United States and Chinese military are not communicating. Um, we need more collaboration. And Austin tentatively seemed to agree with that. But I must say, the political climate in the United States is very ugly right now. There was a study done by Columbia University. Some majority of Asian Americans report hate crime incidents because of the anti-China sentiment that has been rising in the United States, similar to what happened to people who look like Arabs and Arabs themselves after 9-11. Um, it's a very ugly situation. I mean, you have all kinds of strange comments being made by politicians. And I cited the Wall Street Journal article. It's remarkable, you know, the kind of things that can be said and are being said. Um, the Sinophobia, I mean, it's kind of interesting in this case that Sinophobia and the red peril, you know, communism and so on, yellow peril and red peril have collided. And that's a toxic mix, you know, it, it's bringing out the worst in a lot of people. I very much hope that, you know, groups like yours will be out there trying to talk an ounce of sense to people to campaign. You know, I know Code Pink has a campaign called China is not our enemy. Uh, that's an important campaign. I very much hope you will all join something like that. You know, talk to your friends. You've got to dial this back. I mean, I would like to see liberal, sensible lawmakers stand up and say this is outrageous. But, you know, I believe and I'm sorry to say so that they're too scared to put their heads up above the turret. They're just too scared. They don't want to get slammed down by the right wing. And that's a shame. Where is the courage? Lucille Eckrich, who is uh, with the one of our uh, allies, Alliance for Just Money, says, please, can you explain in more detail how the BRICS Bank ends poverty and operates differently than the World Bank and the IMF in particular, what is the nature of money in and monetary exchange relations within and among the uh, BRICS countries of Brazil, China, India, Russia, and South Africa? It's a great question. So the first thing to note is that many of these countries in their trade, merely in their trade, are starting to trade in their local currencies. They are trying to quote unquote de-dollarize their trade. That's an interesting development. In fact, between Russia and China, the trade is almost entirely de-dollarized. They are tra trading in rubles and in renminbi. India and Russia are trading in rubles and in rupees. So they are moving from using the dollar to their local currencies. This is not a seamless process. It's not an easy process, but they're already doing that. The interesting thing about the um, BRICS bank lending, the idea that Dilma Rousseff has been entertaining is to lend more directly on investment projects that are going to help build the capacity of countries, you know, build roads, build schools, build hospitals, things like that. What the IMF generally does is it lends to the government um, in a way that's merely to pay off the debt. The BRICS is trying to say we are not going to actually lend to pay off debt. We're going to lend to do infrastructure projects. I think that's an interesting thing. Their lending is going to be tied lending. It's going to be for projects that are valuable and useful for the people. Now, how is a country to pay off the debt? And here, I think you play a big role. You know, movements in United States, in Europe, perhaps in Japan, that we have to insist as well that wealthy bondholders in the rich countries should take a ma major haircut 
they should no longer be able to get payment for those loans which in many cases were odious loans you know colonial loans or loans to dictatorships and so on we should demand the abolition of a lot of these debts for instance just take one example and i don't know uh, mary beth if your previous guest from jubilee took the example of haiti but it is obscene that us banks continue to take interest payments from haiti it's obscene i mean th that's just an obscenity you know the united states should never have purchased the indemnity that the french enforced on the haitian people that was chase manhattan bank you know th these rich banks these rich investment companies like blackrock and so on use their political power to prevent poor countries from demanding a haircut on their loans and therefore most of these countries many of them in fact more than half of the african states paid more to service their debt during the pandemic than they paid on their health care that was during the pandemic and who were they paying that money to wealthy bondholders in the united states wealthy, wealthy bondholders in europe and in japan that's inconscionable you know that is the responsibility of people in the north movements in the north to lift up a campaign to end to do a jubilee as it were on debt payments from these countries at least the very poorest but in fact i believe everybody 1985 fidel castro organized a conference in havana which called for a complete debt moratorium nobody listened to him he was always worth listening to um, Judith Hand asks, how do the efforts of the United Nations to end poverty fit into the picture? Well, Judith, that's a great question. And I must say, the United Nations is many things to many people. One of the things the United Nations is, which we don't you know, get enough information about, are the agencies of the UN, like UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, UNRWA, and so on, including FAO, World Food Program, all of these agencies. These agencies right now, Judith, in my opinion, the last 20 years at least, but right now particularly, are expressly committed to preventing mass starvation. So for instance, World Food Program, Food and Agricultural Organization, they are not, they don't have a development project. Firstly, they're grossly underfunded. And secondly, they are just airlifting food. Right now, the World Food Program and FAO released a document saying there are 18 hotspots on the planet where there is absolutely certainty of mass starvation, you know, including Sudan, which is in the middle of another political conflict. Um, this is ridiculous, you know, this situation. The UN cannot put forward a genuine development agenda. The one UN agency, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, the United States has been trying to shut down UNCTAD ever since it was formed in 1964 under the leadership of Raul Prebich of Argentina. I mean, the US has never tolerated the existence of UNCTAD, which calls for greater state funding to help, you know, erase the burdens on people's shoulders and so on. So when you ask what can the UN do right now, the UN is basically doing a salvage job, trying to prevent mass starvation around the world. It is not able to move a positive agenda. Trying to see if there are other, uh, if there are hands raised. I see uh, Lenny uh, Via Gomez Reeves has her hand up. Go ahead, Lenny. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, first I wanted to thank you for this extremely good presentation. Uh, what, what, I mean, Given that the U.S. doesn't tolerate any any rivals, um, what what efforts do you think the U.S. is going to uh, take to attempt to undermine the BRICS Bank and other global South South cooperative efforts, especially you know under Dilma, who has has a record of actually doing things? Yeah. And then the other question I wanted to ask is, do you think the BRICS Bank will have any effect? in improving the financial transaction situation, not only for Cuba, but also for other countries struggling with U.S. sanctions and, and blockade efforts? Or is the dollar-based effort, uh, I mean, nature of the international transaction situation too powerful? I mean, will the BRICS Bank be able to function outside the SWIFT banking system network, for example? So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested. Well, 
Well, firstly, Lenny, very good questions. The first question, Dilma Rousseff has been a left-wing you know, campaigner against a dictatorship in her country. She was arrested and tortured, brutally, brutally tortured. She came into politics, faced a coup in 2016, but she is undaunted. Um, yeah. I just spent an evening with her in Shanghai. That woman is unbelievable. You know, if anybody deserves the Nobel Prize for resilience, it's her. I think there should be a Nobel Prize for resilience, you know, human resilience. Uh, it's a lot better than peace because we know, friends, that the Nobel Prize for peace don't mean nothing anymore. Okay. Um, look at the people who won that prize. It's a disgrace. Uh, we, you need to give a Nobel Prize or, you know, the Women's International League Prize for Human Resilience um, goes to Dilma Rousseff. Look, there's always a danger that the United States is going to intervene one way or the other to do something nasty. Um, I, in honor of Henry Kissinger's 100th birthday, I went back and read some of the papers, the correspondence between Kissinger and Nixon against Chile, which will face 50 years of the history of its coup this year in September. Nasty people, I must say. You read Kissinger and, and Nixon um, conspiring to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende. Nasty people. They are capable of anything. But I want to say something about that because I think those days are over. You can throw overthrow one government, the government of Evo Morales in Bolivia, but the government of Luis Arce will come back. Um, you can overthrow the government of, um, of Mel Zelaya in Honduras, but the government of Xiomara Castro comes back. It's very difficult now for the United States to sustain its power. It can try all it wants. It can go and destroy countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. But from each of them, it's had to withdraw without any major gain. So I feel like people in the United States need to, again, tell their neighbors and friends, got to come to terms with the fact that this is not a city on the hill. This is just another city on a plane. There are other cities. You got to learn to live on the planet as equals, not try to impose yourself as superior. So that's the answer to the first question. They'll try, Lenny, they will try, but I don't think it's going to stick this time around. And I'm interested to see what happens at the BRICS summit in August this year in South Africa. For one, the South Africans have said they'll welcome Vladimir Putin into the country. He's not going to The Hague from, um, from Cape Town, where the conference will be held. That'll be interesting. I'm going to watch carefully what happens in August at the BRICS summit. To your second question, I think even here there are some changes afoot. Okay, um, United States has used the dollar system to suffocate Cuba, has used the dollar system to suffocate Venezuela, Iran, so many countries. I don't know if you watched that great American philosopher, um, you know, who was on television recently, uh, Mr. Marco Rubio. Uh, who was asked by the television host about de-dollarization. And that great philosopher Marco Rubio said something quite true. He said, look, it's terrible for countries to de-dollarize. Because if they de-dollarize, he said, we won't be able to use our economic weapons against them. I thought that was a remarkable truism from that great thinker from Florida. So there you have it. The more you see de-dollarization, in a way, the greater uh, you will find countries able to survive outside suffocation from the United States. Uh, Philip Cole has a question for you. Go ahead, Philip. Yes, uh, my question would be, uh, China has uh, initiated the Belt and Road Initiative over the last several years. What are the successes? What are the failures of that initiative? And looking at the fact that China's taken over Sri Lanka's uh, main port due to the failure of uh, them being able to maintain the uh, constrictions of their loan, covenants of the loan to uh, Sri Lanka. See, Philip, that's a really amazing question. Um, there's a great article that you can read in Atlantic magazine by two American scholars about the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka that you mentioned. And why it's a good article is that it's some it's called something like, you know, um, busting the China debt myth or something like that. And when I read that article, I learned a lot about our problems in the world. You see, the Chinese and 
others did a study of the feasibility of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. And what the Chinese and this study uh, concluded was that the Chinese should give one tranche of money, the port should be partly built, and then it should open and start functioning. And as the port, port starts to make a profit, then they can take more of the tranche of money, a second tranche, and expand the port. Well, the Sri Lankan said, no, we want all the money in one go, which was catastrophic. So they took the loan in one go and they found themselves in a real hole. And they had been warned about that by the Chinese as well. Chinese said, we don't want to give you the money. Sri Lankan government said, no, we want it all in one go. That's in the article in the Atlantic magazine. That's not an article in China daily. It's not made up by somebody in the Chinese government. That's two US scholars who looked at this very carefully. So what I learned from that story was that our governments around the world, governments in poorer countries, in Zambia, governments in Argentina and so on, need to have a project, need to understand how to best utilize the fact that for the first time in over 50 years, there's an alternative to the World Bank and IMF. And we need to have a project that is rational, reasonable and well thought out and not you know, jump into the pool of money and say, let's take it all now. Um, so I think some of the responsibility must be borne by governments of the South who have to act in a way with a circumstance, with a kind of rationality. Uh, we need to look at the possibility and feasibility of our own investments that we make and also understand that we have to invest in human beings. We have to improve our universities, improve the education system, bring in people to learn science and tech and so on. We can't be dependent on tech from elsewhere. You've got to develop our own tech. So I would say, you know, one of the things that in our institute we talk a lot about is what is the project of the Global South? We can't spend our whole lives complaining about the United States and the World Bank and so on. We have to have our own project. And I think that's part of what uh, the conversation I had with Dilma Rousseff is like, what is the project of the South? And should the South be encouraged to think big, but also think rationally? Uh, Harriet Haywood asks, um, all of our many free trade agreements are designed to fleece the global South. Do you see a way for these countries to escape the legal repercussions should a country decide to leave the IMF or the WTO stranglehold? Well, it's a, again a good question, but you know, it really depends on um, what's going on. So in the 1990s, for most countries in the world, um, the principal trading partner was the United States. The United States was the buyer of last resort. It was buying the goods and services from the whole world. Today, that scenario has changed. For most countries in the world, including countries that the United States has drawn into a security web like Australia, Japan, Philippines, for all these countries, their biggest trading partner is China. China is now the biggest trading partner with more countries in the world than the United States is the biggest trading partner, you know, etc. Secondly, this year, for the first time, global South countries minus China will have a higher total GDP than global North countries. Now, this has something to do with population as well. Global North countries merely 14.4% of the global population. So much smaller percentage per capita GDP is uneven, but the volume of GDP of the South has grown considerably. Countries like Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and so on have had their own growth dynamics. You know, they, they are not entirely reliant on the United States. The world is changing and trade agreements of the old kind aren't going to be the principal issue anymore. In fact, when the Chinese put up for debate, the RCEP, um, you know, the uh, regional comprehensive economic, you know, that agreement, the RCEP agreement, it's the largest trade pact in the world, doesn't include the United States. It includes most countries in Asia, um, including Vietnam and so on, which have had old animosities with China. In fact, the deal was signed in Hanoi, in Vietnam, uh, includes Australia, you know, um, countries that are, have a kind of political antagonism with China are actually joining trade blocks with the Chinese. So it's not that trade of the old 1990s kind is going to be the principal problem. 
I think the principal problem for a lot of countries is not trade rules. It's actually financing. Um, it's actually financing and, and control over resources. We're back to control over resources, nationalization of lithium. Uh, it's the copper of the 21st century. You know, today in, in 1970s, the debate in Chile led by Allende's government was let's nationalize the copper. Today, the government of Gabriel Boric, not a socialist government at all, but they have on the table nationalization of lithium. We're back to the era of the question of control over resources. It's not trade agreements any longer. That was, in a way, the fixation in the 1990s. Today, the issue is financing and control over resources. Um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, let, let you know that Robin Lloyd says, remembering your appearance in Burlington, Vermont, several years ago, sponsored by Towards Freedom, Wonderful to hear your uh, trenchant analysis again. Does Africa have a chance to escape the uh, US and AFRICOM to install ne neo-colonialism, the efforts of the US and AFRICOM to install neo-colonialism? Nice to see you again, Robin. Very nice to see you. Um, you know, we at our institute did a study last year, I think, on the militarization of Africa. Um, in 2016, the African Union's Peace and Security Council, which is like their Security Council, voted a resolution unanimously asking for no foreign bases in Africa. It's a long-standing Pan-African demand. Um, news reports started to come out about Chinese bases in Africa. I found that interesting. You know, the Chinese have one base in Africa, in Djibouti. And if you look at that base, it has an interesting history. What is the Chinese base in Djibouti? The Chinese have a base in Djibouti. It's a naval station. It's a naval station the Chinese maintain to support the United Nations project of ending piracy in the Gulf, in the Arabian Gulf. Now, I have a problem with the UN mandate against piracy because it doesn't tackle overfishing along the coastline of Somalia and so on. But let that be. It's actually not a military base. It's a base to support a UN mission. United States and France, on the other hand, have many bases. I traveled to Niger in the Sahel region, went to Agadez, where there's the world's largest drone base. Well, whose base is it? United States. Um, you go up to Arlit, just north of Agadez. It's the center of uranium. Robin, you will remember during the period of the Iraq war, lead up to the Iraq war, there was talk of yellow cake uranium from Niger. Remember that? Um, a uh, uh, a diplomat was sent from the United States State Department to investigate. And then his wife, Valerie Plame, was revealed by the Bush White House as a CIA agent. Uh, that was the yellow cake Niger from, for yellow cake uranium from Niger. There is yellow cake uranium in Niger, it was not being sold to Iraq. It's sold to the French. Why? If you go to uh, uh, Arlit in the Sahel, the town is garrisoned by the French Foreign Legion. Um, France controls that town. Why? Because almost half of the light bulbs in France are powered by uranium from that town. And there's a military base there. So I don't think the question is, will the West intervene into Africa? The West has never left Africa, which is why in Burkina Faso and in Mali, there have been four coups, two in each country over the last two and a half years. Why? To remove the French. And in fact, the governments in Burkina Faso and Mali, run by very young people, have ejected the French from there. They've told the French, get out of Burkina Faso, get out of Mali. And Burkina Faso, Mali and Guinea are now in a new process to create a federation. But this doesn't stop anything. The United Kingdom, for instance, wants to build a base in Ghana. In Accra Airport in Ghana, an entire terminal, terminal number five, has been taken over by the United States government. And do you know that if a US citizen enters Ghana, you have to go up to a, uh, an official at a desk at passport control, present your passport, they stamp it, you go in. If you're a US soldier and you enter through Terminal 5, there is no passport control. You can come in and out of Ghana with your gun at will um, because that's the agreement that the Ghanaians uh, signed with the US government. So. United States is there strangling that continent, Robin, and has been doing this 
for a very long time. You know, when when Stanley met Livingston in the middle of the Congo and said, Dr. Livingston, I presume people should remember that Stanley was a US national. Um, and it was the United States at the table in 1885 in Berlin during the scramble for Africa. United States has never left that continent. US government with the Belgians conducted a coup against Patrice Lumumba in 1961. That was about uranium because the uranium that the United States used in the bombs against Nagasaki and Hiroshima in 1945, that uranium was sourced from the Congo, from a mine in the Congo. And the reason the US and Belgians cooed Lumumba was they didn't want that mine to get into the hands of the Soviet Union. I mean, that's the history and it has never ended, never ended. Mm -hmm. I want to get two Thank quick you. questions in. Um, uh, J Janet Slachter has her hand up and then, um, uh, let's see, M Mario Galvan. And I think we're going to have to be done with questions after that. Uh, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, I think, um, Vijay, that your analysis of how the IMF and World Bank work is absolutely correct and on target. And I would like to think that there is a viable alternative. Uh, but um, I wonder if, um, okay, here's, here's a question that asks for information. There is a Chinese Development Bank and there's a Chinese Export-Import Bank. Um, and those are not, um, those operate similarly to like the IMF and other banks that are, you know, making money. So to what extent is China invested in an alternative to capitalist banking? And to what extent um, is it playing both sides? I don't think it's playing both sides, Janet. I think what you've identified is something very important, which is that, look, China is a large country, 1.4 billion people. Um, when I travel to Chinese universities, I'm often stunned and surprised to see how many neoliberal professors are sitting in these campuses. You know, how many of them have Stanford degrees and Harvard degrees, MIT degrees? I'm talking about the economists. Um, the Chinese agencies set up over the last 30 some years are actually very, not only very similar to US agencies, but yeah. they, are they are run by people effectively trained by the same people. You know, uh, they may be Chinese, but they were trained at Stanford or at Chicago. Um, what's interesting is in the last decade or so, and I think the era of Xi Jinping is slightly different from the previous periods. The new institutions set up are in contest against some of these older institutions. I mean, there's a real debate inside China. You know, I, I won't, I don't want anybody to believe it's a homogenous society. You know, despite what people may, may think, there's some real debates in there. And I think that the neoliberals, are pretty strong in the Chinese government, particularly when it comes to economic policy. They are not absent. So yes, of course they exist there. But I think that um, some of the agencies like the, you know, uh, the New Development Bank and some of the Belt and Road agencies are not exactly, you know, following the nostrums of neoliberalism. The problem, Janet, and here I'm going to be completely honest with you is the post-development scenario or framework isn't very well articulated. Um, next month, Tricontinental will release a, a, um, a dossier. It's an it's a extended study on the history of development thought. And we end our dossier saying, can we imagine a new socialist development paradigm? You know, look at it. This is where we are today. Just asking, can we even imagine? So I think it's a big struggle, Janet, and I'm not going to fudge around and say, well, you know, this, that, and the other. I think it is very true that there is a struggle inside the Chinese government and the agencies. Okay. Hey, okay, and um, Mario Galvan, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, um, my question has to do kind of with what you're talking about now. Um, uh, I see the new changes happening in the world, you know, with the growth of the of the global south uh, economically, and you know, through you know, through development, uh, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative. But my question and my concern is that is this is this new alternative and this new rearrangement of global politics and political power 
Are, is this going to be, are they going to be continuing the, the kind of industrial development that is leading to uh, climate change and the, and the, uh, the global crisis of the environment that we're happy, you know, uh, are they addressing, you know, the, you know, the, the, I guess the environmental aspects of uh, increased industrial development, you know, I've, I've heard often that, you know, the, the, the whole world cannot live at the technologically advanced stage that the US and Western Europe are living in. What, what do you see in terms of that problem? Thank you. And thank you very much for your presentation and all of the work you've done and following you for years. Thanks a lot, Mario. Thanks a lot. Um, well, Mario, the most dangerous thing in the city of Shanghai is to stand at an intersection and not look in all directions. And that's because almost all vehicles in the city are electric vehicles, almost all vehicles. All delivery people drive electric vehicles. And I've often been hit by a number of them, okay? Uh, it's very dangerous. China is one of the world's leading producers of green technology. Um, I have mixed feelings about the debate around industrialization. I think we're going to have to continue to industrialize, to electrify countries, for instance. We just need better, cleaner energy sources. Um, we, you don't need to, industrialization doesn't mean carbon heavy industrialization. You know, we've got to be inventive and clever. We can't talk about freezing everything because after all, look at India, hundreds of millions of people um, in deprivation. You know, I mean, I don't want to live in a planet where people don't have access to schools, to electrification and so on, to, to you know, uh, enough nutrients to have a good life, you know, some leisure and so on. So we're going to have to see, you know, industrialization take place in many countries, processing take place in many countries. The issue is, will this be based on a power source that's destroying the planet? Um, will we need to have the kind of extractivism that we've had in the past? So can we be inventive? And I, I think humans will have to be inventive. You know, we can't have a kind of economic apartheid permanently set in place in order to protect the planet. You know, where we say, look, close down all the coal factories around the world, um, you know, in the poor countries, because the rich countries have already devastated the carbon budget and the poor countries now have to just live in poverty so the planet survives. It's a super unhealthy approach, right? I mean, obviously, neither you nor I believe that. Um, but we have to be quite clear to people that, you know, there are ways to industrialize and grow things um, without destruction of the planet. I think we have to look at the kind of um, energy sources that are out there that are already being, you know, used by places around the world. I mean, the Chinese are the largest producers of solar panels. Is that a good way to go? Well, we have, there's some doubts there because batteries are very dirty. Um, batteries are hard to get rid of. Is there a different way to do a battery? Um, must it use, um, you know, uh, coal, cobalt and must it use lithium and the mining for these things are horrendous. So let's not pretend that green technologies are somehow clean technologies. They have their own dirtiness to them, you know? But we need to think about these things together in an honest and sober way. And I fear the room for that is gone. You know, look at look at how strange this is, friends. And Mary Beth, let this be my last comment. It's kind of a sad comment, okay? Um, look at it. The Green Party of Germany, you know, came out of the forests, the black forests of Germany, screaming about the need to protect the planet and so on, right? And nuclear power in Germany, amazing and coal fired power plants in Germany, amazing. Today, what is the Green Party? The Green Party wants more and more war. After all, they got involved in the war in Afghanistan. They pushed the Germans to get involved. They were eager to join the war in Iraq, even though Gerald Schroeder, then chancellor from the SDP, was very much against that war and Germany didn't join. Today, the Greens basically are saying, you know, let's continue with the, um, the Ukraine with the with the uh, nuclear powered plants and perhaps even bring back coal because we don't want to cut a deal um, with the J Russians and so on around Ukraine because we're not going to accept their natural gas. I mean, so much for being in favor of the planet, you know, so much for being in favor of the planet. This is the descent of environmental thinking. So we need some honesty, clarity, decency in this debate, Mario. I totally agree with you. 
that the issues have to be put on the table. Uh, we need people to be able to exit from abject poverty to live rich lives, not just exit from abject poverty. You know, and for that, I think people have to be sensitive to the fact that hundreds of millions of the people in the planet are in hunger now, and their hunger isn't going to be ended. Uh, by good words, but only with deeds and those deeds need financing and that financing has to come without strings and those strings have to come with science and will we be able to do that? Thanks a lot.